today. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We have Todd Albert, founder and lead instructor of Boca Code, joining us. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and get started with a quick, a quick presentation. And then Todd, I'll hand over the mic to you. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Only one screen, Todd. So you're going to have to help me out a little bit here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay, let me just go ahead and open. Oh, I have a bunch of tabs open right now. All right. So, so today's workshop is on building your app fast and go to market. I'm sure there's a lot of startup founders and entrepreneurs on here trying to get the inside scoop from Todd. If you guys don't know who we are, we are Palm Beach Tech. We're a tech nonprofit that is building South Florida into a tech hub. And we do so by providing you all with awesome resources, a little bit more guidance and just connecting our community that's growing every single day. Even um, we have one of our members here, he moved from Miami, now he's in Boca. So it's just cool to see how our community is connecting already. Yeah, so again, we're a nonprofit building South Florida into a tech hub. We have over 200 members. We have a bunch of awesome people, about 2000 people in our organization alone. And we also have a growing number of partners, like you can see below, FAU Tech Runway, 909, Venture Cafe Miami, and a lot more. So this is our community creed. So we always try to put people first, try to do the right thing, and make sure we're a inclusive community for all. And that's one of the things we go by on a day-to-day -day basis, and we provide resources for disabilities or whatever, whatever we have to face with on a daily basis. All right, so these are just a few of our current members. We have Boca Code on here at the bottom. Uh, we have City Furniture. They're a tech company that sells furniture. And then we have Modernizing Medicine, um, a pharmaceutical company or just anyone who's in that space. We have Digital Resource Office Depot. So the good thing about all these companies is that they're all creating innovative strategies to help build our community. So obviously the one thing we do have in common is tech. So that's why we're all part of Palm Beach Tech. <laughs> All right, so these are just a few of the events that we offer every single week. Uh, today's actually Friday's workshop. We have Todd joining us. And then we also have our weekly podcast Wednesdays where we interview South Florida leaders, entrepreneurs, and just people really impacting our community. Tuesdays, we have community coffees every Tuesday at 8 a.m. So we bring in a panelist uh, for a, kind of like a fireside chat discussion on an issue or something that we're facing on a day to day. And then Mondays we have our tech talks. So and next community coffee is going to feature Jan. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. Next him. Tuesday. I'll make sure to put the link in the chat as well on Facebook and LinkedIn. And um, yeah, Mondays we have tech talks. It starts at five thirty. James is on there all the time. It's networking from five thirty to six, and then we go on, go on with the TED style presentation. All right, so this is our big event, our annual hackathon. It's going to be kicking off tonight at 5 p.m. It's coding for good. So uh, each team's going to create a solution for two local nonprofits, Feeding South Florida, Gift of Life, who are facing day-to-day -day problems. And we're really just putting the community together. We have some awesome sponsors. Todd, our speaker today, is actually, actually going to be one of the coaches for the weekend. Thanks again, Todd. James is going to be joining us. Jan's going to be joining us. It's going to be an awesome time and if you if you're not participating feel free to join us sunday for the presentations you can go ahead and rsvp on eventbrite i'll also enter the link in the chat and yeah if you haven't done so already join our slack you know it's we put some fun memes in there we put a lot of valuable information local events that's going on or just open discussion plus jobs Jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> so this, these are just a few of our membership benefits. Um, if you have any questions, please just go to palmbeachtech.org and you're able to see a little bit more about what we do. Uh, we offer speaking opportunities like this one that we're doing for Todd, job listings, resume, distrib resume distributions. Um, and we have an exclusive member portal that we just recently kicked off with. Um, and we're gonna get started soon with exclusive member benefits and discounts. So that might be a surprise for 2021. So stay tuned everybody. All right, so that's about all we have for our presentation. I'm gonna hand over the mic to Todd and I'm super excited to have you Todd. 
Well, thank you. Thanks for passing the mic. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And yeah, so today, um, you know, thank you self to South Florida Tech, Palm Beach Tech, whatever name you're going by today um, for sponsoring this. Thank you, Nikki and Monica for setting this up. Thank you guys all for, for being here. Um, I'm Dr. Todd Albert. I am the founder and lead uh, instructor at Boca Code, one of the lead instructors at Boca Code. And what I wanted to talk about is the topic today is build fast and go to market. And for entrepreneurs like Keith that are on the call, this is very relevant. But also for those of you like, you know, James that are on the call that are doing the hackathon this weekend, it's also relevant. So I'm going to be talking to those two audiences, the, the entrepreneur building fast and going to market and the hackathon, um, you know, uh, the, the hackathon participant who wants to, you know, is going to have 24 hours this weekend to build something that's, you know, hopefully ready to go to market as well. So, so just so you know, I'm, I'm targeting, targeting both of you. Um, so the first question that I want to talk about is, is why, why should you, you know, as an entrepreneur, why should you build fast and go to market, right? Before I tell you how, I want to tell you why, right? So as a startup, you have two main priorities. You should be focused on two main things always. This is widely accepted as, as two rules in business. When you're in the startup phase, you do two things. You minimize how much money you're spending and you maximize your number of users. So you wanna try and bring in as many users as you can and minimize how much money you're spending to get there. And so by not building out a giant application and taking years and years and years to build, but by building fast, building quick and getting to market, you can spend less and focus on, on getting your users. There's, it also allows you to test assumptions, right? Getting to market fast allows you to test assumptions and validate your business model. And I put a picture here from one of my favorite shows called Silicon Valley. If you haven't watched it, get off of this workshop right now and start watching. This is an amazing show. Um, but part of it and not, you know, sorry for the spoilers for those who haven't watched, this team of engineers built this amazing product and they were, they tested it, they sent it out to their friends, everyone loved it. And then they went to market and it was a complete failure because they were looking at it as engineers, not as humans. And all of their friends that they sent it to were engineers, not real humans, right? Us engineers are not real humans. So you, you're, you're making these assumptions, you're thinking like an engineer, you're not thinking like the everyday person necessarily, or, you know, you know, Keith's not an engineer. He's, you know, he's, he's a realtor, he's a businessman, but he's not necessarily the same as his user. So, you know, you wanna make sure that you can go to market fast so you can test your, test your model. And there's another way to put this and it's called fail fast. And this is actually a, um, I don't know that this came out of Google, but I first heard of it um, when I was involved with uh, Google's moonshot program, which is called X. It used to be called Google X, but then when they became Alphabet, it's now just X or Project X. And I was involved in Project X for a little while and their, their philosophy is fail fast, which you know, takes the emotion out of it. When you're, when you're an entrepreneur like myself or like Keith or like Jonathan, you know that you put your heart and your soul into your company and you're so passionate about it, it succeeding. And you're, you know, if you're smart about it, you'll set milestones, you'll set benchmarks for yourself that, okay, by such and such a date, we have to reach so many users or some other, you know, um, key metric. And, but you should set, you should set different levels. Like, okay, if we get to here, then we blow up our marketing. If we get to here, we have to pivot. If we get to here, if we only get to here it's, or, or lower, it's considered a failure and we shut down. And it takes, you set that months in advance. So when you get there, there's no emotion in it. You just, you, you're using logic to decide. Um, as entrepreneurs though, we don't usually operate like moonshot projects. We, you know, if, if we fail to meet our, our, our benchmarks, then, 
you know, we probably have investors and our own investment in it and other people that are counting on us to make this work. So, you know, we, we tweak, we shift, we change, right? So if you're, if you go to market fast and what you go to market with doesn't work, doesn't quite work, you can tweak, you can shift, you can change. But all of these are reasons to go to market fast. So how do you do it? How do you go to market fast? The first thing is you start simple. And for most entrepreneurs, this is so hard. I work with a ton of clients. I, I, you know, most of you guys know me. Most, most people here know me. Um, um, I run a code school, but we also, you know, Boca code, we do things a little differently. Our students work on real projects for real companies, right? Um, like Mr. X on the call, um, you know, he's, he's got a project that, that we're working on as well. We, I meet with entrepreneurs all the time and they often come to, you know, any entrepreneur, any entrepreneur, and even, even in a hackathon, right? It's a, it's a similar way. You, you come up with an idea or, or your team comes up with an idea and you start, oh, we, we could do this and build this and build this and build it. And before you know it, your, your spark of an idea becomes a flame and your flame becomes a, a blaze, right? It becomes this blazing fire. And that's awesome. You should have that passion, right? That's what you want. That means your idea is good. If you, if you start with this idea and it explodes into something massive, that means you're passionate, your team's passionate, and, and your idea is good. But if you, when you go to build it, you don't want to build this. <laughs> you have to come back to your original idea. And we call that the minimum viable product. And in, in tech terms, we use the term MVP all the time. And, you know, sometimes I have clients that, that don't come from the tech world and they hear MVP and they think sports. I, apparently this means something in sports, but in te the tech world, this means the minimum viable product, which means taking your idea and scaling it back to just what's needed to, to go to market, right? And oftentimes that go I say, go back to that original spark, that original idea you had. So whether it's at the hackathon this weekend and one of your teammates presents, hey, what if we built this? And then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh yeah, and we can add this and add this and add that. Start with the start with the spark, build that first. And then if you have time in the 24 hours, you can, you can layer on some of the other ideas, right? So that's why I say here, start with the spark, build the blaze later, right? So you know, Keith, when he came up with his idea for his startup, it started here. That's what you build first and it's grown and grown and grown. And then later you start adding on and building those other things. And that's really hard to do, right? So the other thing is you wanna start with a single platform. Don't try and go live on Android, iOS, web, Tenzin TV, Samsung Smart TV, Nintendo Switch, Xbox, like every freaking platform there is, you, you want to start, you want to start with one platform. The cheapest and easiest and fastest is often web. That may not fit your business model, but usually it's a good place to start. And I talk to people all the time and they're like, oh, well, you know, look at Facebook. They've got Android and iOS and web and this and that, but even Facebook, when they started, they just started with web, proved they were successful. I think a few of you might have heard of that company, Facebook. I mean, they've got a few users now. So once you get your, yourself a few users, then you can build out to mobile and things like that. So again, this is, this is a piece of advice that applies to most startups, to most hackathon um, you know, projects, not, not every project. But most, you could start with web, you could build a progressive web app, you could show it on your mobile device, but then people don't have to download an app and it's way faster and easier to, to produce for the web. But the key here is do only what you need, right? Build what you have to, to get yourself live. And then every week you can roll out new features, but for get yourself live and get yourself on the market. And that's something I actually admire about Keith. I've been working with him for a while. His product, he's like, oh, I still want to build this, 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 and this, but I'm going live. 
And I love that about Keith. That's that I think that's the right thing to do. Number two, make sure you have the right team. In business, it's really difficult if you have a team that's dragging you down. If you have people that you feel like you're having to pull along, you want people that are equally as hungry as you are. Um, but you also want to the, the right team to build the product, right? So you have to have what I call product team fit. You always, in marketing, we talk about product market fit, right? You have to build a product that's going to fit your target market. But you also, if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a hackathon team, you want to build a product that makes sense for your team, right? Make sure, make sure that your team is capable of delivering that product, right? So for an entrepreneur, this, this could mean getting the right people on the team that understand your vision and that are capable of delivering your product, right? And sometimes that might mean losing dead weight. On a hackathon team, you you get put you're you're in a team, you're not going to change that team. That's your team. So build something that that team is really good at. If you get put on a team and you realize like, oh my god, we don't have any software developers among us. We all like to do video editing. So create a, an amazing video. Don't try and learn how to code in a weekend, right? Do what you're good at. Do what you know right? If you're an entrepreneur and you want to build a tech product, right? And that's your, that's your business. Don't get on your, on your team. Don't have co-founders where none of them are tech people, right? If you're going to be a tech company, you should have a tech co-founder. Right? So make sure that you have a really good, a really good team that fits your product. And if you don't, then either consider changing your product or changing your team. Oh, yeah. So if you have a bad team for the product, adjust the product better to fit the team or the team better to fit the product. So the, the key here, the key takeaway from this number two is build what you can, right? And this is really important for the hackathon, right? If you're, you know, if you're going this weekend, don't try and build something where no one on your key team is capable of building it. Um, make sure that you build what you can. And then the third, the third key principle here is make sure you have the right tools. So this is all about working smarter, using component libraries, using site builders, using pre-designed templates, right? If you want to go to market fast, don't, don't start with, you know, a fancy, a fancy design that no one that's going to take weeks to implement. Even with Boca Code, right? I'm a, I'm a tech company. Our website now is beautiful, but when I launched, it was a crappy template I bought for $14.99 and it looked like crap. I designed it, right? I'm not a designer, right? And then after we launched and we, we started getting some students and some traction, I was able to pay a designer and, and, and have it developed out. Start with frameworks right? Frameworks are meant to make your job easier, right? I know some people are afraid of these words here, React, Angular, Vue, but if you have people on your team that know one of these, you know, if I'm doing a hackathon and three people on my team know React, heck yeah, we're using React. If nobody knows React, but three people know Vue, we're going to use Vue. So pick the tool that, that works with your team and that'll help you get, get up and running fast. So really, you, you should always be leveraging libraries and frameworks for your project. These can save you thousands of hours, right? These, these libraries that are built, people put thousands and thousands of hours into them, and they already institute best practices. There is no reason to build these from scratch, right? Maybe, maybe after you've been in business for a year, you want to build your own version. You know, you need an image cropper, you just get one that's already built. Maybe you don't like the way it works. Maybe you don't like the way any of the image croppers work and you have your own idea of what an image cropper should look like, but start with a library, put it live. Doesn't matter that it's not exactly what you want. A year from now, you can afford to rebuild that because now you have clients. Use CSS frameworks, right? Bootstrap and Material, Materialize or Material UI are very popular. 
There's a ton of others. There's component libraries. Use these. These will help save you a ton of time. You can go in and see, oh, they've got a nav bar and it gives you code and you just copy and paste that code and now you have a nav bar and now you can just edit it. It's so much faster than trying to build that from scratch. So leverage existing tech and not just frameworks like that. Like if you want to build a blog, you know, us developers, we're capable of writing our own blogs and making our own, you know, creating a database table and, and creating a blog and creating a theme for it. But there are already libraries out there. You could use WordPress, you could use something else and just use that to start, right? Like, you know, Keith is Keith and I have had a lot of conversations about this, about just using the existing tech, getting your users, and then later you could build out your own fancy platform. So stick with the tech that your team knows, right? And James, I want to, you to you to hear this for this weekend, right? Don't focus on what you know, focus on what your team knows, right? Don't focus on what you want to build, focus on what your team wants to build, right? Um, try, don't try and use in a hackathon untested tech that's going to be, you know, unless it's really critical to your app. All right. So that's the how to do it. Now, where do you start, right? Number one, always start by sketching out the user flow. This will save you so much time in the long run. And especially it's a very easy visual way to communicate what you're trying to build. And you will, when you start sketching out the user flow, you will realize parts where it doesn't work. You were thinking, oh wait, but no, they can't go from here to here because they haven't done this yet. And you'll solve all those problems with a simple diagram you can draw on a napkin before you start building and having to solve it when you're, in the, when you're coding and spending thousands and thousands of dollars. You can literally draw this on a napkin. And this is always where you should start. And this is this way, what often happens is you have a team and everyone's describing the same thing. Yeah, it's a tree with rope and a, and a swing, right? Everyone's describing the same thing, but everyone might have a different vision in their head of what that tree and rope and swing look like, right? So you wanna make, if when you start drawing out the user flow, you start to get on the same page. Oh, somebody needs to sit on that swing and, and actually be able to move. Oh, that's a little different. So the second step is now to wireframe. And this should be done pencil and paper, if possible. Do this on pencil and paper. And you know, even though we're virtual, you can literally hold up your drawings and be like, you know, like this was this was a um a silly, you know, one I did, I did last week. Oh, great. I'm a, with my virtual background, you can't see it. Hang on a second. Sorry about that. Let's, uh, let's show the messy room behind me. There we go. So, you know, literally pencil and paper, right? And you can show your team on Zoom. Yeah, I have to sh shut off your virtual background, but you can be like here, and then we put a button here, and then this does this and da da da. da. And you know, or, and, or, you know, like Nikki said in, in, on the hackathon this weekend, you're going to actually have whiteboards where you can draw, but I actually recommend drawing it on paper first, get your idea on paper. It's so much faster than trying to draw it on, on in a whiteboard, start with paper. It's faster. And that's what this is about. This is about being fast, right? Don't try and add color. Don't try and add style. This is a picture. This is a hamburger menu, right? Very simple. Here's the tab bar. It doesn't have to look great. You can use little circles. You don't have to be a good drawer. Perfection is the enemy of good, right? Remember this. Don't try for perfect. Just go for good. And that's, you know, that gives a, a double meaning to the hackathon this weekend. Code for good, right? Don't, don't try for perfection. Just try for good. So, and, and then when you want to, when you want to really wireframe, there's kits out there where you can drag and drop and use things like this, et cetera. So you can find wireframe kits. All right. Number three, the third step, build for one platform. As I said before, start with web, if you can 
That's usually the easiest, cheapest, fastest. Start with the hardest tasks first. This is true again for whether you're a startup or whether or or a hackathon contestant. People will make the mistakes that are like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna build a login page and then you're gonna choose your plan and then you're gonna go in and we're gonna use AI. And what do they do? They build it in that order, right? And then you've got like four hours left at the end of the hackathon to build out your AI, which was the hardest part, right? So start with that. And we actually have a client at Boca Code that we're working with, a 1909 member, where we just built her a prototype of, a, a, we're building her app. And that's exactly what we did. We started with the AI part. We built that, gave it to her. She now has a prototype she's, that she's sending out. And now we're building the login and the choose the plan, the easy stuff, right? We know how to do that. That's the easy stuff. We built the hard part first. You get it out of the way. You don't leave it till the end where it could you could run out of time. And it's the most impressive. So when you go in front of the hackathon judges, you even if you don't finish the easy stuff, they know you can do that. You did the hard stuff. It's good to show that off. Um, so that's that's a good place to, to start, whether you're an entrepreneur or hackathon. Number five, don't build out the back end if you can avoid it. There are services called BAAS, back end as a service. One of the most popular and my favorite is called Firebase, which is owned by Google. And when Google bought Firebase several years ago, they have built it out from one service to all of these services here. You've got machine learning, cloud functions, real-time database hosting that you can deploy with one line of code, cloud storage, analytics, A-B testing, all of this stuff built in without having to build your backend, without building an API. This will speed up your development. This will speed up your going to market. This will speed up your project. You can build an app that doesn't need an API. It doesn't need a backend. Um, again, hosting on Firebase is really easy. Firebase deploy is one, one line to deploy. Um, their free tier is extremely generous. It's Google. It's infinitely scalable. You know, as you scale up, you start to get out of the free tier and you might have to pay a couple of pennies a month, but it's the fastest of all of the hosts I've tested. And I've tested a lot of them, including AWS, Google Cloud, all kinds of things. Um, there are other ways like Heroku, Now, Surge, Netlify, et cetera. I know Netlify and Heroku are very popular, especially for hackathons. They're very easy as well. Um, but if you're an entrepreneur, you're worried about, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't deploy here for now and then later have to spend the money to move over here. Just start, start at the top. Start with Google Cloud where it's fast and it's scalable or Firebase, which is built on Google Cloud. Step six, I know some of this is repetitive. This is intentionally repetitive because I want to reiterate this. Use existing code libraries. It will save you time. They institute best practices. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you don't know what this stands for, NPM, Node Package Manager, this is your best friend. This is every library in the world pretty much lives right there and you can install and utilize all of these great libraries and NPM will tell you how popular they are, um, when they were last updated, how many people use them, how many stars, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do some due diligence before you choose and end up with a shitty library. Number seven, similar vein, use templates. Find a, a template that looks decent, that kind of matches your style or what you're going for and use it. Don't try and design a website from scratch to start. Just buy a template. Now, Damien, one of my co-coaches for the hackathon and very dear friends, he's, he's all about free resources. And so if you're at the hackathon or you're an entrepreneur and you're like, I don't want to pay $15 for a template, Damien can help you find free templates. I'm all about quick just go find a good one, spend 15 bucks, and boom, that saves you, you know, hundreds of hours of work. 
Some of them actually come with builders, drag and drop builders, where you can just drag the components around, put in the put in the the text you want, kind of like Squarespace style, but it gives you the HTML. And some of them even some of them even have you know will will export uh, React for you, although most of those aren't good. The ones that uh, except for one, but it's in beta. Number eight deliver weekly builds. So I actually recommend for an entrepreneur that you give yourself a maximum of six months to go live. Six months is roughly 24 weeks. Hackathons are roughly 24 hours. So when I say week, if you're in a hackathon, you should think hour. So think about this. If you're an entrepreneur, you create a working demo in a week. Okay, so maybe the first week you're doing, you're doing your um, user flow diagram and your wireframing. That's week one. Or for a hackathon, that's the first hour. Second hour or second week, you want to actually create a working demo because now your team all sees the vision. The coaches see what you're trying to build and it's easier for them to help you. Or as an entrepreneur, your partners, you can show off to your friends, your partners, your clients, your prospective investors. Hey, this is what we're building here. Now they can see the vision. It's much easier, right? And also with a hackathon, if you run out of time, every hour you've got a new version with new features that you're deploying every hour on the hour. So if you run out of time, you're like, oh, we couldn't fit this in. Let's just go back to the version we had an hour ago. That worked fine. That's the goal, right? You want to constantly be rolling out, deploying a demo, and adding new features and releasing every week for an entrepreneur, every hour for, for a hackathon, right? So, so Keith, you know, you just launched Frantech 360, this really cool new platform. Your goal should be every week, okay, we want to add a new feature. We want to add a new feature once you're really in the development phase of that. Number nine, set a go-to-market deadline. I kind of hinted at this a minute ago. I said, give yourself six months max, right? And by then, you want to have a beta quality app that is go-to-market ready, right? That means you can turn on advertising and start sending people to your site and it should have a marketing page, it should have a page where people can land and know what the hell you're doing. It should, you should have a marketing plan in place and a go-to-market strategy. Give yourself six months. All right, so I have a few more minutes. I wanna give you a few more mantras to live by. Number one, clear communication is key. I don't care hackathon or billion dollar company, you want to make sure everyone on your team is on the same page. It's very important. Don't try and fly solo. Make sure you're in constant communication with your team and everyone knows what everyone's expecting of each other. Remove any barriers to communication. If you can, I know, you know, in COVID, this is a little different, difficult, but you actually want your team to be sitting together ideally. Right. I know that Nikki and Monica spent a lot of time for the hackathon finding the best software that really gives you that feel. And I, you know, I know the due diligence they put in just, just to find the software for the hackathon this weekend. You know, these these two are are working so hard to make this really successful. Um, but as an entrepreneur, you want to do everything you can to minimize barriers to communication maximize access to info. You don't want people in the dark, right? Everyone should be together. And this is one of the reasons why Dennis, one of my students who's on the call, he's so excited for us to open up the physical school at Boca Code because that face-to-face -face is so much more efficient than trying to do things over Zoom and online in most cases. Pair programming, again, easier in person, but very doable online. One person's coding, the other person is watching. This sounds creepy. It might sound inefficient, like you're having two people do the work of one, but it's actually more efficient because that one person is not gonna make any mistakes because every, 
every typo is caught immediately. Wait, why did you make a capital U there? And you did a, a lowercase u over there. Oh, you're right. Whoops, let me fix that. Immediate, you see it and you're asking questions. Wait, why are you doing that in a for loop? Shouldn't you use, a, a, you know, shouldn't you do a, a map function? Oh yeah, that would be better. So you're catching these things immediately and it's actually becomes much more efficient. And then finally, another thing, even, even if you're in the rush of doing a hackathon, even if you're in an entrepreneur rushing to get your product to market, something to consider is test-driven development. And it sounds like there's more steps involved in this, but it's kind of like the pair programming where it can actually speed things up. So what you do is you decide, okay, we need our app. We need to add this function to our app, this ability capability to our app. So you write a test that tests for that capability. It fails, right? You write the test first, which fails because you don't have the capability yet. Then you add enough code to your app to make that test pass. So you now have that functionality. Then you go back and you refactor the code to make the code good. And now the test, the test passes. And now as you add functions and functions and functions to your app, as you're ripping along in the hackathon this weekend, or you're ripping along as an entrepreneur building out your application or your product, whatever that may be, you're gonna be testing every step of the way and making sure that this new feature you add doesn't break a feature you built um, you know, three or four steps before. So one last thing, I think I keep saying it's the last thing, but that's the, that's the downside of having one screen. I can't see what's coming next. One other thing I want to mention, and I know that some of you maybe have heard this before, but there's always a trade-off between launching fast and building it right. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you a story of two of my good friends and, and, and people that I've, I've worked with before in the past. These were junior developers that I helped mentor and, and they're still good friends of mine. I mean, no disrespect. If they were on this call, I would still tell the story. Launch fast, my buddy Jesse is the king of launch fast. You literally could describe an app to him. Oh, it's gonna do this and it could do this and has this feature and that feature. And by the time you're done describing it to him, he would hold up his phone and be like this, and he'd have it built. Like, no joke. This guy could prototype an app in no time. It was unbelievable. The app would be absolutely horrible UI. It would be buggy as hell, but it would work. It was unreal. On the other side of the spectrum is my buddy, Greg. Greg was the exact opposite. You would describe an app to him and he'd be like, okay, I have 400 questions for you before I even think about how I would architect this. And you, and depending on how you answer those questions, he's got 400 more. And it's two months before he starts writing a line of code, but he's gonna write the most impeccable code, but it's gonna be months and months and months before he's ready to go to market. Those are the two ends. Those are the two extremes. I worked really hard with those two and actually made them work together sometimes to help bring Greg into the middle. And I'm really proud to say that he just launched his own product very quickly during COVID. Awesome health screening app. And Jesse, who's now writing very quali good quality code and much more reluctant to launch. So they've both come and met in the middle, cl closer to the middle, which is where you want your developers ideally. Right. And Reed Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn, this is a very popular quote. You see this quoted all the time, said, if you're not embarrassed by a first version of your product, you've launched too late. And so, you know, entrepreneurs need to keep this in mind. And again, this is something like I mentioned that that Keith, who's on this call, I really respect about him. He's like, let's go live, you know, and we'll fix it. We'll fix it as we go. That's great. You know, you're going to, your, your users will understand if you're constantly rolling out, you know, updates, they'll understand as long as it's not like causing people in hospitals to die, you know, it's, it's okay. Right. And the same thing is true with the hackathon. Like no one's expecting your product to be perfect, right? You're going to have bugs. It's going to be quirky. You're going to mess up a little bit in your demo, but impress us with, with what you did 
Um, and you should be a little embarrassed. It should be a little flaky and quirky, right? Because you're going to try and do so much in one day. And that's okay. Also, top-down management, it doesn't work with development. It's, it's very slow. You need continuous, iterative process. Um, so developers should be, should be kind of, uh, it's, it should be more democratic. The management style should be servant. What can I do? How can I help you? Not, what did you do last week? It should be, it should be more of a servant style. And I just threw in a couple of other agile principles here that are really useful, like delivering working software frequently, right? That was that idea of rolling out every week or every hour. Um, lazy coders are the best coders, right? This gets into like, you know, not re reinventing the wheel. If there's an easier way to do it, do it the easy way. And then finally, and I promise you, this is the final thought. <laughs> what if you get stuck? What if you're in the middle of the hackathon, you're trying to build something and you get stuck or you're one week away from, you're one week away from launching your, your new product and everything's broken and nothing is not, is working. And this is like the scariest thing. This is the scariest thing in a, in a hackathon. This is the scariest thing for an entrepreneur. All of a sudden, you know, the excrement hits the fan, right? What do you do? You ask for help. We've got an awesome community here, right? The hackathon, you're going to have great judges. <clears throat> um, you know, you've got amazing people like Monica and Nikki always at the ready, right? They may not be able to solve your tech problems, but they can connect you with somebody who can, right? You've got me, you've got Book of Code, you've got people like Damien. And, and even people like James who are always willing to help. So, you know, ask for help. Don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid to admit when, when you're stuck or when you're failing. This is something I spend a lot of times, all the developers over the years that I've mentored, one of the things I've had to teach them first is to stop asking for help. And then second is to start again. What do I mean by that? All of the young developers, when they start out, they're like, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? How do I, and you're just like, Shh, Google it, Google it, Google it. Try the, you know, look at the, look at the manual, read the freaking manual, read the freaking, the answer's right there. And, and you get them to start being independent and doing things on their own. But then they start being independent and doing things on their own. And then they get really stuck on a real problem and they have to learn again. Oh wait, they have to learn to, you have to learn to recognize the difference between something you can look up and find really quickly and something when you're stuck and you're spinning your wheels and you need to ask for help. If you can't find an answer in five or 10 minutes, ask. That's the best advice I could give you. And that's all I have for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, holler at me and my email, Todd at bocacode.com. Please check out the school. We're brand new. Um, we're awesome. Bocacode.com. We've got intro and advanced classes. And pretty soon we're going to be announcing some much larger, more interesting things. So stay tuned. Yeah. Thanks, Todd. That was great. Um, Thank you. And I just want to add to that especially for the entrepreneurs out there or like, you know, the techies getting started, like at the end of the day, we're all human. So when we do see a startup or a newer company and we see kind of like a glitch on their website, we kind of just laugh like, oh, haha, we can relate. Even on our website, sometimes we get error messages, but it's just, I feel like it's part of like the organic experience that we face or even, you know, in co like the COVID times now, it's allowed mistakes to be a little bit more normal. You know, when your dog, starts barking or your kids start running in the room. So that's kind of how I see it when it comes to like, you know, um, making mistakes as an entrepreneur or like a techie. But uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? Feel free to take yourself off mute. We can do like a quick open discussion with about 10 minutes. I know I have a few questions, but I'll save mine for the end because I always talk too much. <laughs> Never. I got one. For either the hackathon or the entrepreneur company thing, I can't believe I said company thing. I can't believe myself. 
which agile methodology is right for for any of them like yeah the the answer to that really depends on the team james um you know that's one of the whole things with agile is agiles is what's called non-prescriptive meaning it's it gives you guidelines like hey these are some concepts and and ideas um scrum is is a very popular framework that helps with agile being agile um but even scrum there's you know most teams bring on bits and pieces of it um kanban is another one that's very popular um, you know, just having a Kanban board with user stories and you just move them across from, from left to right as they, as they progress from back burner to in progress to, you know, to being tested to done. Um, you can kind of mix and match a little bit of Scrum and a little bit of Kanban. Um, it's for, for a company, you know, it's really important to establish some kind of project management agile system for a hackathon it's also important as well um i've seen hackathon teams do really well where they actually have hourly meetings right they actually hourly they take a five minute break they do a stand up um like a little scrum it's really cool um some of the teams though they spend you know you don't want to spend more time on project management than on actually building right so you want to keep that in mind you want to reduce friction coming together saying hey how can we speed things up how can we be more efficient don't do that by having you know too many meetings and putting too many things in place especially for the hackathon but i recommend for you know at the at the very least having a kanban board having tasks assign those tasks to people and then being able to track and see where people are and what where people are getting blocked, right? So if if there's somebody on your team who has three tasks and everyone else is done and their their tasks haven't left the starting block, you can see visually like, okay, we need to jump in and 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 help that person on the team. Um, you know, maybe they'll be better off working on other tasks. So I like that visual aspect of Kanban. I'm a very visual person. So I really, I, I, I tend to go for Kanban, but I would discuss that immediately with your team. You know, hey, what are we gonna build? Okay, what are we gonna use for project management? And then, all right, who's doing what? And let's go and, you know, start with that, you know, user flow, right? That's great. I'm also a visual, I'm also a visual myself. I mean, yeah, so Kanban, <laughs> Kanban may really work for you. Unless it were, unless the team, the rest of the team members work with something else and I'll have to adjust. Yeah. Whatever works for the team, you know, it's, it's, you want to let go of all of all hangups this weekend. You don't have time for, you know, to, to dig your heels in it's, it's time to work as a team and, and, and go fast. And that, you know, I think the entrepreneurs, you know, the same is true, right? You know, you, you can, as an entrepreneur, it's really easy to do the same thing to be like, well, I want to do it this way, but all the rest of your team wants to do it this way. Maybe it's time to just let go and, and do, do your team's way. And, you know, maybe they're wrong and maybe your way is right. And, you know, after, after a month, maybe you switch and, and start doing things a different way with the hackathon. You don't have the luxury of time. Right. Um, but, but for the entrepreneurs on the call, that aren't are like what is this whole hackathon thing um a few weeks ago we did we did like a a, a quasi hackathon at 1909 where four of the startups at 1909 had had teams working for just six and a half hours to see how far they can go and it was amazing how much work could get done in in a short period like that with with everyone being you know rushing and focused um, so the whole hackathon model, if you're, if you're not involved this weekend, I really recommend at the very least tuning in Sunday for the presentations to see what these teams accomplish, because it's going to be so inspiring and, and it can inspire you in your business to say, Hey, maybe, maybe we need to, you know, take on, you know, take some, take some, uh, you know, clues from that, from that hackathon and, and see what we can what we can do or from what 1909 was able to do.
Yeah, Todd, and, and just to kind of add there, um, especially if you're an entre entrepreneur here recruiting, looking for a software developer, uh, UX UI designer, there's gonna be a lot of talent this week in there too. So check it out on Sunday. Um, and another question I did have for you, Todd, was, you know, we're talking, we're talking about how important team building or having the right team is. What is the ideal group for the team to be successful, you think, for, for a product to go to market? So I know for the hackathon, we're doing a project man manager, uh, UX UI designer or a developer, kind of just like um, an engineer. But like, what, what would you say would be an ideal team for an entrepreneur? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, it really depends on the size of the project and the scope of the project. Um, you know, no, no two projects are, are equal, right? Um, I, I found, you know, a company, a company really has to be a certain size in my mind to warrant a, a standalone project manager. In, in many cases, you can have somebody who has multiple skill sets you know, especially for a startup, it's really important that we wear multiple hats. Um, so somebody who's maybe a UI UX designer and a project manager, or, you know, very often with Scrum, for example, the Scrum master will also be one of the developers, right? They're just the developer who's like, you know, keeping everybody on the, you know, on that Scrum mission. Um, that works really well for startups, for small startups. Once you get to the point where you've got lots and lots and lots of engineers and developers, then, you know, then it becomes prudent to have a separate, you know, I think like somewhere around a dozen engineers, now you want a, a project manager. Um, but, you know, for, for a hackathon, a project manager can be really, really, really useful because of the speed you need to go at having somebody who's who's keeping everyone focused and driving the tasks forward. Um, the right project manager can really help that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, it's a great question. I wish there was a magic formula. Um, I always, one thing that, that I have found though, is a lot of startups, they, they don't want inexperienced developers. So they're just like, I'm just going to hire all senior developers. And a lot of times those teams can work like a kitchen and in a kitchen and, and, and Jonathan, you probably can speak to this really well, having, having run a couple of restaurants in the past, you don't want all head chefs in the kitchen. That won't work, right? Head chefs like to bark orders. <laughs> they like to have sous chefs chopping vegetables for them or, you know, boiling the stock or getting things out of the freezer. You, you need, you need people at different levels on a team and very often having a single leader on the team a single senior developer on the team is way more efficient. Somebody that can, that the juniors can look up to like that head chef, you know, a head chef and a bunch of, bunch of sous chefs, you're going to be able to, to crank things out faster in the kitchen than if you have, you know, more than once, you know, you know, too many cooks, right? That was a really good reference. Yeah. Yeah, you do not want like five sous chefs working next to each other, or just five cooks. <laughs> yeah. So I've always had the best. I've always had lots of luck with with loading my team with junior developers. They're eager. They want to learn. You know, but they need they need a mentor. They need somebody who can who can kind of steer the ship. But even you know, I've worked. I have a couple of clients that, or or a couple of part. Um, partner companies where I just work on an advisory role, they have all junior developers and I just help, you know, like once a week, just meet with them and say, okay, yeah, you're on the right track or try this or try that. And, and it can work. So don't be afraid to, to load up with junior devs. They're, they're, you know, they could be workhorses. Awesome. So it looks like we're right at time. It's 11 a.m. If you guys have any additional questions, please just reach out to Todd. I, I mean, he's he's awesome and he's quick to respond, even on our Slack for Palm Beach Tech, or I know Boca Code has a Slack channel as well. But thank you guys all for coming. Um, it's great to see you guys on this Friday. And I, and I know I will see a lot of you guys this weekend. Um, Todd, thank you. You 
an awesome job. We love having you. And if you want to share any final Thanks work, again. Yeah. Yeah. And please, any like, especially the entrepreneurs on the call, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, Todd at bocacode.com, just shoot me an email. We'll jump on a call, whatever you want. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. I hope everybody. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you guys tonight. <laughs>